AI Mentors is brought to you by Aulis International, covering your business's staffing, consulting and networking needs. Our podcast, AI Mentors, brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI Mentors cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. My name is James Baker and you're listening to the AI Mentors podcast, the show where we hear from the experts in AI and data science who've already navigated their way through the complex field, but built teams and are offering their advice to support others on their journey. Today's guest is Hendrik Brackman from Finiata based in Berlin. First of all, Hendrik, a huge welcome to the show. Hey, James. So, Hendrik, you moved from London to Berlin to head up the data science function of Finiata. What, what brought about that move? So, I'm originally German. And then lived in the UK for five years, so went to uni there um, and was heading the data science team at uh, Market Invoice. And I wanted okay. to uh, get back because for like well, personal reasons, also because Brexit, I didn't really know what was happening. And <laughs> really to get the opportunity. None of us do. <laughs> A couple of friends of mine uh, were here at the company, and so it was a pretty easy uh, start. And Pinata was quite interesting as well because um, in essence, what we were trying to do is to try to do something very similar to what I did at Market Invoice, which is um, giving uh, invoice-based credit. Um, but what Pinata was was doing, which I think is much more exciting, trying to um, approach a, a smaller segment, so something in between uh, businesses and actual uh, consumers. Um, and in order to do that, they really needed to build a very good um, credit engine. And that is something that, that made me quite excited and which is why I joined the company. Okay, so can you tell me a bit more about what FIAR to do? Because I think a, a lot of people will be really interested to, to understand a bit more about the company. Sure. So Finiata is, um, has been founded two years ago, roughly. Uh, and what we do is we try to help uh, freelancers and one person companies very small companies and um, to run their businesses and we try to do that by taking all their worries around um, any money for cash flow um, out of their out of their head and um, so traditionally speaking banks have a little bit neglected uh, this segment because it was deemed too risky too costly to underwrite and so we are trying to build um, an engine here um, to be able to give credit to these people by a having very automated processes but also by identifying the people that will actually repay us uh, with a high degree of accuracy. Okay, fabulous. So it's, it's, it's companies or people that may struggle to get credit through the standard channels, then you, you will look at that segment of the market? Yes, correctly. Okay, brilliant. And so I can imagine that type of company, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a startup, two years old, the, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different projects going on. What type of projects are you currently working on? And so at the moment, there are two main areas. So one of them is the credit side. I already touched upon that, where um, we are really trying to identify the people that we want to give credit to and the terms as well. And on that front, there are two main projects. So one of them is um, there's a new financial product which we are developing. So we need to develop all the um, risk modeling around that. And on the other side, we are um, streamlining our infrastructure to be able to scale much better to A, higher volumes of data, and then B, also to um, just more uh, models for different purposes. And then on the other side, as I'm trying to get much more involved on the uh, marketing front, where um, we want to have much more data-driven decision-making, and specifically, so we implemented um, different A-B testing um, strategies, we also got involved into attribution modeling, performance marketing. So we now have all our funnel uh, completely tracked, which has made me personally very happy. Impressive, really impressive. And you know, just moving on, you've gone from academia into industry. So you've you've worked for you know, you've you've been at university and you've made that that step into academia. You've taught as well at university. How did you instigate and how uh, manage that? that transition from academia to industry? Well, so I think I, during my whole life, I, I always worked and I really enjoyed just getting things done. And from even in the army, I'm, I was um, talking myself into automating reports. So I think it was sort of a natural tendency for me. But I think the, the one thing that is really strange to um, experience once you move full time to, to the industry is that you don't really work on these like well-defined problems, right? So in academia, you have like 
um, a specific task which you need to complete, which are very well defined acceptance criteria in a way, um, and that makes makes the work relatively simple. Whereas in in the industry, I feel there's much more things which are moving simultaneously. So there's like possibilities that the people that come to you and want something from you don't really know what exactly they want. So you have to sort of find a way to to manage manage the goal, while at the same time you can like change the data set that you have, which is a possibility you usually don't have in academia. You can sort of build the infrastructure that you need um, to productionize your, your system, which is usually also outside the scope of a problem you would have in academia. So okay. while um, I think the, the actual technical part that I learned in academia was still valuable, for me what was really new to learn is that the, the problem that I was learned was much, much wider defined then A, people tell you, and then B, also, um, then you're used to from academia. And it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear because we, we speak to a lot of people who are in academia trying to make the move into industry. And you know, there are a lot of challenges on the way, and, and it's, it's great to hear yeah, the, the challenges that you encountered. How did you overcome them, or how have you seen people overcome some of those challenges? Well, I think um, the main part is... Um, so I mean, obviously, if you find some kind of mentor or anyone who can help you, that is great. The other thing is you just need to have an open mind. So yeah. you can't just um, assume that because you did certain things in academia, they will always be true. And um, yeah, being some kind of uh, be a, being relatively pragmatic. So yeah. um, you can't just in academia you are like want to like code up algorithms from the ground up and then like understand every single detail of what you're doing and I think practically speaking like you don't need to like for every problem that you have code up every algorithm that actually makes you quite inefficient so like you just need to get used to just importing a lot of libraries and then just getting stuff done relatively quickly yeah I think it's 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 really tough, isn't it? Because a lot of people are, are perfectionists and they want the job job done perfectly. But what a lot of people tell us is they they're looking for that balance between things that work, things that do what they're meant to do, but they're also the speed of delivery and getting them up and running quickly enough so it's actually uh, solves a business need in time. So I think that's yeah. uh, that's something that that we we hear a lot from from people in the industry who are looking to find the ideal 100 percent agree and it's even just understanding what the problem is is i think a, a major issue so solving a problem which actually relates to a business need is a, an actual skill which i haven't really appreciated before moving to the industry and, and i think that's that's probably one of the beauties of data science that everyone's calling it the sexiest job of you know of the century so it's a pretty uh, a pretty cool place to be but you will also look at people who are technical, but also have that business understanding, people who, who make the link between the board level and the business. And that, I think that's that's a really exciting place to be. 100% agree. Like, traditionally speaking, you have this Venn diagram of um, business, uh, math stats, and engineering. And so data science is supposed to sit in the, in the middle of that. Um, and I think it's just amazing to see how these three different areas can um, be brought together to produce something which is bigger than the three parts. Ah, cool. So you, within Finiata, within your, 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 your previous role as well, how have you managed to influence, promote artificial intelligence and data science you know, within the company? So the way I try to approach things is try to keep things simple and easy. So what I don't want to do is I want to go to people and say, okay, what problem do you have? Um, tell me your problem. We will then work on it for one and a half months with you, about you knowing anything about it. And then um, after that time, we will get you something which may or may not be what you want. The way I try to approach it is just trying to give like very um, easy, simple help, but in a very short period of time. So if someone comes to our department or we also actively uh, try to reach out to other departments and we try to identify what are the biggest levers that we can have in a very short amount of time. And most of the time, um, there tends to be very simple, just descriptive statistics and then trying to, to relate these statistics to actual decisions. So just trying to understand, I don't know, the in this case, for example, with the attribution modeling, where exactly is our biggest um, spending, which doesn't um, doesn't yield any outcome, and then trying to cut that down significantly. 
So that is an example of trying to go to a different department, trying to understand what their problems are, and then um, giving them help, not necessarily on a high extreme mathematical level, but on a very practical, yes, you have a problem, I'll help you in like two, three days to solve it, even though it might not be the most uh, complicated one. And then once you have established that relationship, then I think you can gradually move to more complex things. Okay, because I think with this this relationship so important and it's such a big part of the role, isn't it? That if if a culture's right, then you're able to make an impact through data science. If the culture's not right, then it's very difficult to do anything. And and that all starts with building a relationship with the key stakeholders within the business to help them understand how you uh, how you can add value. One hundred percent. A lot of it comes down to trust. So it's hard to understand. Um, even for data scientists, to be honest, like what the models exactly are doing. There are some ways to, to figure it out, but um, it's hard to explain that to uh, a lot of the business units. So a lot of it, I think, comes down to generating a level of trust between business units and data science, which then gives um, data science sort of a little bit of leeway of like understanding exactly the business needs, but the business side also um, a little bit more trust that if they give up like a certain decision, a certain um, like opinion that they may have, and that they, that the data driven decision will actually be better than that. Have you had to deal with uh, internal politics either now or in the past that that have really sort of made it difficult for you to implement what you want to implement? Um, yes, I think so. So there are quite a couple of decisions where people tend to have like very strong opinions on what is the right thing to do and what is not the the right thing to do and i think in in my experience if you have like multiple people with have like super strong opinions on like two opposing topics um you don't necessarily are able to um convince them straight away that like data is the way to resolve that you try to go to these people and you try to pretty much introduce them to the data driven way of making decisions in very like small things. So you don't go to them and say like, okay, this thing that you feel like super strongly about, let's make a data-driven decision there. But you go to the things which are less emotional about, where they just think, okay, this is like a thing that we need to do. I don't feel like very strongly in a particular way. And you try to get them to make data-driven decisions in, in these areas first. Mm -hmm. And then once they're getting used to the idea of making these data-driven decisions in these areas, then you can actually um, go to these like more emotional topics. You, you chose a career in, in data science. Why, why was that in the first place? Well, I think I always just loved analyzing decisions. I played a lot of different games. I, uh, when I was in school, I played Magic forever. I played a lot of poker, chess, StarCraft. Um, my whole university education was just around probability theory, trying to figure out um, what are like good trading strategies and so on. So that was always something that I loved. And then I was given the opportunity to um, do that for a living, to analyze the decisions, to try to make good business impact with that. And to me, this is just the most exciting part of, of yeah, my job. Uh, interesting. So, so it's all the strategic background, you know, poker, chess, these are strategic games. So those have sort of led you naturally into a route of data science. Well, Yes, I think they're very closely linked. If you think about it, um, the value that data creates is really improved decision making. So to me, like playing these games have taught me a ton about what are good decisions and how do you have a process of making good decisions. And in a way, data science is just a formalization of that. Yeah, there's another big topic that I think that I think is really, uh, really important and useful to talk about, and that is this this data driven culture. Uh, companies either have a really strong data culture or they don't, and it's, it, it makes a huge impact on whether the data science function is successful in, in implementing what it wants to do. Uh, what, how do you see a data-driven data environment? What, what do you see as a data-driven environment? So I think there are different stages in a way a company goes through. So I think the, the first stage, most basic stages, that you at least define your goals in some quantitative um, way that you have goals which are KPIs in some sense. That's I think the very basic first stage. And then once you have that, you you go into the stage of thinking about what is um, the actions that I can do to actually 
achieve these KPIs. And the second stage is then to use data to understand what of the, the possible actions that I can take actually help me achieve these KPIs. And then the, the third step is to actually step away from, okay, I, I don't actually need to, to do the decision myself. I don't actually need to look at the data and then make the decision, but to even outsource that to um, a machine or an algorithm, something like that. So to move to a completely automated decision. Okay, so there's different phases and different stages of, of becoming data-driven. And it takes, I, I suppose what you're saying is it takes time to get there. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Very few things happen overnight. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. So how did your company come to understand the importance of, of a data-driven environment? So I think the company was already founded on the idea that um, we want to give money to people who've been neglected in the past. And the way to achieve that is actually to build a credit model, which is um, better than what uh, other providers are currently offering. So in the, in the credit space, I think the idea that we need to be super data-driven uh, was very prevalent for, for quite a long time in the history of the company. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and that, I think, gave us already a, a good group of people from which you could work with to expand it into other areas of the business as well. Uh, which other areas of the business in particular? So you talked about marketing. Marketing, uh, product as well, so that we can now actually prioritize um, our features based on pretty much exactly the way that users behave and how that behavior relates to any kind of uh, micro conversions that we have. Okay, great. And you, you've, you, you've come through, um, you, you, well, you've had a career that's, that's developed in, into a management role. So you've, you've seen a lot of different stages of you know, your, your career and your development. What advice would you offer people who are looking to show the value of a data-driven environment to their stakeholders? I think the most important part is try to start simple try to really help your customer so i think specifically if you come from an engineering background and i've seen this multiple times in the past there are two things which you um tend to do which are a little bit um hindering you to build a good culture the first thing is you focus on over engineering something so instead of like trying to provide a simple statistic or something and trying to solve the problem that the other person has um, within a day or two, you try to build like a complex model um, and yeah, invest a lot of time in trying to get to 100% of the answer, whereas you could easily get to 80% of the answer in a very short amount of time and then would help other people to appreciate your value much more. Because usually what they want is not to get 100% the best decision, but just um, the most likely best decision in a very short amount of time. And the other thing is just trying to understand the business well. So I've seen lots of projects going horribly wrong because in any sense, um, data scientist was working on intellectually, mathematically super interesting models, but models which didn't relate to any business problem. So it didn't relate to any way revenue or like reduced costs. Um, and I think that is another pitfall to fall in relatively easily, that you just are so obsessed with the idea of building a, a super interesting model that you sort of forget what is the actual impact that you have with the, uh, the model that you build. And then I suppose it's a challenge to keep the backing of the organization to, to keep sponsoring that team within the company? 100%. At some point in my life, I um, had to let go of a person because in any sense, what the person was doing wasn't really aligned to business goals. And to me, that taught me like a very important lesson. So in order for data science to, in order for me as a manager to be there for my, um, for my people, I need to make sure that every one of them actually serves a valuable function for the business. So um, it goes both ways, right? So the best way to put yourself in a job and to get more resources as data science is that you actually deliver value. And you can only really deliver value by creating actual business value. Alongside that, you have to build the right team with the right skills, with the right people. Of course. And, and how do you see that you know, ideal team looking? What type of skills do you need for, a, for the ideal data science team? 
Well, ideally, you have these amazing data scientists who can do everything. Um, but the, the reality, unicorn. <laughs> exactly. But the reality is, is usually not um, that you find these people in high numbers. Um, so the way I think about it is you have people who tend to be, um, I just group people in this Venn diagram of business skills, math and stats skills, and then um, engineering skills. And to me, you want to have people more or your team more or less balanced in these three areas. So you have uh, people who are naturally strong and having a good business understanding and are strong enough in math steps and in engineering to, to fulfill in a way a product function, right? So they pretty much they do the communication with the with the business, they take up the requirements gathering and so on. And they explain to the other people what they actually want uh, need to do. And then you have the quite strong um, engineering people. And the way we are set up, we also develop some infrastructure. So for us, they naturally perform all of the things which um, yeah, are related to data infrastructure. Yeah. And then you also have the math stats people who are very much just focused on, OK, we now have a, so I guess the stereotypical academic, we have a more or less well-defined problem that this product guy actually told me about. And then I will figure out the 100% correct way of, um, of actually solving this problem. So you never find this like as clear cut distinction between these three. Yeah. Um, but at least that's the way that I'm trying to hire in my team to, to have a balance between these three types of, um, of people. Yeah, sure. But I think it's just any sense to get a team which um, works well together. So what, what are then the biggest challenges building you know, the ideal data science team? So given the description that I just gave, I think the biggest challenge is having good communication lines between both all the people within your team as well as the business team. So regardless of role, what I place a high emphasis on is good communication skills, both uh, verbally as well as in writing. Because I think um, if you don't have that, there's, um, yeah, in essence, a lot to be lost by misunderstandings from the business requirements to the sort of product role to the uh, data science and uh, engineers. Okay, and do, and do you have top tips that you give to people within a data science team if they want to become the best they can be? Well, I think always be curious. So always try to learn about anything. Um, ask as many questions as you can and have an, an open mind. Um, so all the really good data scientists that I know, they probably spend three, four hours a day just on um, learning about new, well, A, technologies about new um, yeah, ways the, the business or the industry is evolving as well as about uh, yeah, new libraries, new ways to implement. So just be extremely curious, try to learn as much as you can about really everything, because um, data science is quite an interdisciplinary discipline. So the idea that you, oh, I already need to be, only need to be good at algorithms or only need to be good at um, engineering isn't really applicable. So just try to insert as much information as you can. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that in data science, people are so passionate about what they do. And when, when a new tool comes out, a new technology comes out, the buzz around that and, and people going off to learn it and, and start, start sharing in the community is, is really, really quite impressive. That's, that's another thing which I think is quite important as well. Don't have fear. So if you think there's some like, good idea to, to approach something, just go and try it out. Go and try it out. That's the best way of learning something by just having an idea, implementing it very quickly, and then seeing what comes out of it. Great advice. So um, the final, final question from, from me then is that you've, you always have two options in a career, or at least two options. One of them is to go down the, the management route, and one is to be more of an in, individual contributor. What are the pros and cons of each? So since I've come down the management route, I will start with that. So I think the biggest pro of the management route is you are much more involved in the, in the wider process of how data science is being applied. So right now, I'm not really working on like, like individual decisions as much as I'm just working on 
trying to build processes for the data scientists to be involved in, um, in data decisions uh, particularly well. So you have much more influence in terms of building a machine of um, successful data scientists rather than uh, being that much tied to a particular decision. Whereas if you're an individual contributor, I think it's, it's exactly the other way around. So you tend to get like super deeply involved into particular things and thing, and you need to um, understand a particular requirement particularly well, but you don't have necessarily the same overview of the different problems and you don't necessarily have the same yeah, influence in um, changing not your, your small part on what you're working on, but also the other parts. Okay, but you really get get to get stuck deep into a pro into a problem, and uh, and spend some time getting that solution. So there's something really special about just um, understanding a particular part of the system very very well, and then people are coming to you because you are the one person who actually really knows how things are going on, and then being able to give advice to sort of architects as well the way this develops. I think this is a, a very exciting role as well. Fabulous. Well, Hendrik, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time and for and for the information you've shared today. It's been it's been really really interesting. And thank you very much for for your time. Thank you as well. Get the Aldus advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following: AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all the members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.